Hi, you're ten. Welcome back to your second online lesson. In the first lesson, we talked about how the Earth began to form. Uh, more importantly, our solar system, how did that start to form? And then what happened in the early Earth? Um, we left off at the Hadean Earth, so the early stages of Earth's formation. Before we get started though, I'd like you guys to attempt your do now questions. So if you haven't done the first lesson, these questions might be quite difficult to do. So I'd advise you to go and do the other one first and then look at lesson two afterwards. So the do now questions are, number one, what are GIFs? And I'm not talking about animated cat videos or anything like that. I'm talking about something related to the formation of planets. What are GIFs, G-I-Fs? Number two, what does proto mean? What does the word proto mean? What do we call flat spinning disks in space? This is question three. What do we call flat spinning disks in space? Question four, how old is our solar system? How old is our solar system? And question five, what is accretion? Question five, what is accretion? What's the definition of accretion? So as ever, I'd like you to attempt these videos, sorry, questions um, before you skip ahead in the video. So if you wanna try these questions, I'll show you where to answer those in just a second. But you pause the video here and you can answer these questions. Thank you very much. So the answer to the questions, what are GIFs? So we talk about GIFs and planetary formation. It stands for giant impact fragments. So remember we talked about big planets or protoplanets, more specifically, um, forming around the early sun and they were smashing off bits of rock off one another. So these bits of rock would get destroyed and smash up into smaller pieces and get bigger again. And these pieces of rock are called giant impact fragments. They've been fragments caused by a giant impact, essentially. Question two, what does proto mean? Proto is Greek for original or primitive. So when I talk about the proto sun or proto planets, I'm talking about early, original, primitive suns or planets. The first kind. And then our planets and suns are formed from that earlier version. An example I use was a prototype. We talk about a prototype car or a prototype device. Could be a prototype um, computer. It's the first kind of original version. Um, and then we may change that later on. Question three, what do we call flat spinning disks in space? We call them protoplanetary disks or proplids for short. So remember I was talking about the pizza. Okay, it's like spinning a dough. When you spin the dough, it gets flatter and flatter. This happens a lot in space. We see it in Saturn's rings, the Milky Way galaxy, and it happened in our own solar system while it was forming. How old is our solar system? Our solar system is believed to be 4.6 billion years old. So just over 4.5 billion years old. So it's fairly young when you consider the whole age of the universe is 13.8 billion years. So it's not been around forever. It's not been around since the start of the Big Bang. So it's 4.6 billion years old. And what is accretion? The textbook definition of accretion is the growth or increase by the gradual accumulation of additional layers or matter. So it's talking about clumping together of rock to create planets. We call that accretion. Awesome. Okay, so where are we going to find all this information? Or where do I want you to put this? So if you go into Google Classroom, and I click here, this is the home page. Okay, right at the top, if you click Classwork, you will see this is scheduled for 10 a.m. So it's kind of dull gray at the moment. Some people today, when we were in class, told me that they saw the Google document or Google Slides up on the right-hand side. So just check there, it could be different from mine. But what I want you to do is click on the Google Doc, whether it's here or down here. And I thought this would be easier than the slides we used yesterday um, to answer your questions. So you can answer your do now questions here. I'll put the link to this video here, which you're already watching, so that's okay. And the questions I want you to ask. 
uh, answer, I should say, for this lesson today. So if you have this alongside the YouTube video you're currently watching, pause when you need to answer the questions. And when you answer the questions here, they will automatically be sent to me. Okay, let's close this back to the lesson. So what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about accretion and the formation of planets, but there's another really important word that we've seen but I haven't explained. And it's quite difficult to say sometimes, um, but it's coalescing. Okay, what do we mean? What is a coalesce or to coalesce? To coalesce, when we talk about this in the terms of the Earth, we're talking about all the rocks started to coalesce together. And what it means is the coming together to form one mass or one whole. So if you have a bunch of space rock that's floating around, that would coalesce when it formed a single big rock or planet. So other words for coalescence is coalition, conglutination, I've not came across that one to be honest, combination, merger, fusion, union, blend, amalgamation, concretion, and unification. So it means coming together. And I've heard it before in different areas, um, not related to planets, but particularly in rivers. So rivers can coalesce to create one massive river. So these are called tributaries. And the tributaries start off quite small and they form to small, quite slightly larger trips, then larger tributaries again, and eventually they all coalesce into one large big river. We can see this with train tracks as well. They're coalescing to form one train track. And when raindrops, rain, uh, rain's falling from the sky, you have a single raindrop, but when they coalesce, you can form a big puddle or a pond. Okay, so coalescing is merging of lots of little things to form one big thing. So it's not just related to planet formation. So in our case, we're talking about maybe some um, GIFs, giant impact fragments forming together, to coalescing to form one big planet. So we've talked about that, the Earth coalesced, okay, or the Earth was coalescing at this early stage, about 4.6 billion years ago. So we need to talk about the next stage, which is water, which we all need. We need to drink water every day, and that's where we think life started getting going on Earth. So water on Earth, we know, particularly in this part of the world where um, we have been suffering from drought, um, how important water is, but water is super important for life as well. So it's important to know where it came from and how long ago it has been on Earth. And it's why we're looking at other planets if it has the liquid water or ice at least then it gets scientists quite excited because we believe okay if there's liquid water on that planet there's a high likelihood that life could have maybe evolved on that planet as well and one of the best places we think in our own solar system is actually a moon it's called europa and it's a moon of jupiter and it has a, it's covered in ice and we believe underneath that ice there's potentially an ocean and if that is true then there's a really high possibility there's life there. Now we're not talking about big fish or sharks or whales, you never know, there could be something fairly substantial, but more than likely it's when we're talking about single celled organisms like microbes and bacteria, but that's still really exciting to see that life potentially could have got going somewhere other than Earth. So how do we get water on Earth? Well, there's some debate, but a lot of people believe that comets, which can hold quite a lot of ice, um, bombarded Earth and the ice would eventually melt on Earth and started to fill our planet with water. So remember our Earth was being constantly bombarded in these early stages by uh, celestial objects like comets and asteroids. So when the comets would crush into the, the Earth we believe they broke up, they were full of ice and that potentially was one of the ways that we got water on this planet, which is quite cool if you think about the only reason we have water is because um, these space rocks were hitting into Earth. It's pretty interesting. So where is the water on Earth? Well, we have water uh, found in these three major categories. Number one is oceans. That's where most of the water on Earth is. 97.2% of all water on Earth is found in our oceans. Some of that is locked up in glaciers. Uh, we know that they're receding um, with the increased 
temperature around the globe, um, but 2.15% of all water is found in glaciers. And so a really, really small percent, 0.65% of water is found in the ground. So that's where people use their bores to try and get into the water in the ground, lakes and rivers, in the soil and in the atmosphere. So a really tiny percentage. And if you look at those three categories, the only water that we can really use to drink is in that very small category. So that's why it's so dangerous, particularly in this part of the world when we have drought, um, because we can't get access to a lot of water and it's not that plentiful. Versus if you go to Scotland, it's, um, yeah, we have the opposite problem. We've got too much water. So, um, yeah, it depends what part of the world you're in. Some people have more, um, some people have less. But you can see it's a really precious commodity. Okay, that's how we think water got onto Earth. Then we had the formation of our moon, which was really important for tides, um, for triggering nocturnal animals later on. So the moon was a really important um, thing that had to be created during this really violent accretion process. So what we believed happened, it's called the giant impact hypothesis, um, because no one was around to see it at the time, but this is the best evidence, best guess we have with the evidence provided. It suggests that Luna, which is the technical name for our moon, formed from the debris, so the fragments, after the collision between proto-Earth, so the original version of Earth, and a Mars-sized planet called Thea. So this massive Mars-sized planet collided with Earth, it's called Thea, and when it collided with the proto-Earth, um, it tore off big chunks of the Earth uh, that was forming, and then the debris, the rubble, or the giant impact fragments, started to coalesce around the Earth. So Earth had a big gravitational pull compared to these tiny bits of rock, and then the Moon started to form around our Earth. So the moon that you see every night used to actually be a part of our planet. And when the Apollo missions went to the moon, they took loads and loads of rock samples. And that shed a lot of light on the type of rock that was up there, very similar to the old rock that we can find in some parts of Earth too. So this is a diagram. Um, it's not great in terms of the, the writing, but this is quite a good illustration. So Thea hit the Earth about 4.5 billion years ago. Um, then two, intense heat is created by the impact. Huge amounts of debris from both Thea and the Earth form, are sorry, thrown into space. Question three, or number three. The debris coalesces as it orbits the Earth. So remember, amalgamates, gets together, forms, fuses. And then four, the moon is formed from the debris. And if you look at the moon at night, it's covered in all these craters. And that is evidence, really strong evidence of this process actually happening. So all those craters are formed during this um, really violent process of the moon forming around the Earth. What I'd really like you to do, and I'm being kind, I'm not asking you to draw this one. I'm asking you to draw this one. It's a bit of a simplified version. But if you could draw a diagram like this in your book um, with all the steps, be as detailed as you want. Um, but then I want you to take a photograph and upload that to the Google Classroom and just share that on the, f the front page of the Google Classroom. It'd be really cool to see what you come up with. But I think this is a really neat diagram. You see Thea smashing into Earth, the impact, the disk of debris around the Earth, the debris coalesces to form our moon. It's a really neat little diagram. So if you pause the video here, I'd like you to draw this in your book and then share that with us on the Google Classroom. Okay, let's have a look here at the core accretion and the magnetic field. Core accretion and magnetic field, what do, what do I mean by that? Well, <clears throat> the sun couldn't pull the heavier elements, okay? So remember I talked about the formation of the solar system. We have the large gassy giants in the outer orbits of the sun. In the inner orbits, the close, closer to the sun, we have the heavier elements like iron forming the rocky planets. So Venus, Mercury, Earth and Mars have all these rocky planets close to the sun. They spiraled and gelled together into planets of their own. Earth coalesced surrounding matter to form a sphere. And the heaviest material in that matter, like iron and zinc, sank to the middle of the Earth 
to form the core. And finally, lighter material remained on top to form a crust. So what actually happened was during the Hadean Eon, the Earth was so hot because it was covered in radiation from the supernova explosion nearby that caused the initiated the formation of our solar system, but also um, it was being bombarded by all of these asteroids and it was a really, really horrible place to be for a human, but the Earth actually melted. And when the Earth melted, uh, all the heavy elements like iron, remember 26 protons, sank to the bottom and the lighter elements rose to the top. Now that is super important because now you have in the middle of our Earth a core made up of metal like iron and zinc. And when it's melted, it creates a magnetic field. So our core produces this invisible most of the time magnetic field. And that was super important. Without that magnetic field, you and me would not be sat here just now. That magnetic field protects us from solar flares, solar radiation. Um, so if we didn't have a magnetic field, the sun's energy would be too much and destroy any life that was here on Earth. So you may have seen some of these images. I think I've spoken about it in the past as well. I was extremely fortunate to see this when I was back in Scotland, um, the Northern Lights. The Northern Lights are an amazing phenomenon that we see near the South, uh, sorry, the North Pole, and we see Southern Lights as well in near the South Pole. And what we're actually seeing is the magnetic field. The magnetic field is protecting us all the time. It's surrounding the entire globe, but they're particularly strong at the North Pole and the South Pole. And what happens is the sun will release a kind of solar flare at certain points. And when it hits off our magnetic field, um, it creates this amazing color um, that we can see near the poles. So I'd, always, I'd put it on everyone's bucket list. You need to see this at least once in your life. It's phenomenal. Um, but that's what the northern lights are. It's actually our magnetic field deflecting solar radiation. Okay, we're going to stop it there, guys. We'll go into this tomorrow. Um, but have a look at your questions. If you have any issues, please ask me while I'm online on the Zoom tomorrow. And if you have any questions after that, just post something on there and I'll get to it as soon as I can. Okay, cheers, guys.